Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. Well, I have the pleasure today of being with Aaron Volpatti, author, cognitive performance and injury coach, speaker, retired NHL player, and burn survivor. And you all know how much I love talking about hockey. So I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about that today. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Thanks, Larry. Excited to be here. Yeah, I am excited for this conversation, and we'll talk a little bit more about why in a minute, uh, outside of the fact that we have the hockey connection. Uh, yeah. But I, I like giving our audience, you know, our listeners, a little bit of insight into who somebody is. We're going to talk about your story and, you know, how you got to where you are today. But, you know, maybe you could just share some background about who you are growing up, kind of what led you to the point of you doing what you do today. Yeah, when when people ask me to have a you know a shortened version of who is Aaron Volk Patty, I always say uh, I don't maybe want to throw the term expert, but you know I like to think so when I say I'm an adversity expert because you know every piece of adversity has has really been a gift in my life, and and every piece of success or greatness I've had, it's it's literally always been preceded by very extreme adversity, and you know reflecting back as I you know, get a little bit older in life here. I, you know, it's all been by design really. And, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's the shortened version. Uh, I grew up in a little small ski town called Revelstoke, BC and, you know, got introduced to hockey being in a small town, Canada. And, uh, yeah, that thrust me on a path of junior hockey and, uh, you know, we'll get into the rest, but, but yeah, just had a really great childhood in a small little ski town and, didn't really have a lot of adversity. So when I got thrust into it, it was kind of this whole other world, right? And I had to navigate sure. through that and, you know, discovered some of the, you know, the powers of the mind and visualization along the way, uh, which, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, but. Yeah. So let, let's dive right into one of those, you know, a- adversity <laughs> moments in your life, right? Uh, and, and you've defied the odds in, in, in many ways, in, in many mm-hmm. different instances and situations. But I, I think one of the most powerful uh, things that you overcame was being in the Vancouver General Hospital burn unit. You know, can you share with our listeners, you know, how did you end up in the burn unit? And, you know, how did you summon the strength to continue to pursue your dreams, even when you were told that you'd likely never play hockey again? Yeah, so I was, uh, you know, like many people at that age, you know, I was 19, almost 20 years old. And I was, uh, you know, a pretty reckless teenager. I thought I was invincible and untouchable and always doing, you know, dumb things for attention, adrenaline, you know, feeding that. Don't we all? (laughs) Right. Yeah. So feeding that young ego. Right. And for me, part of it was living up to that fighter stereotype a little bit too. Right. I was always like the crazy kid from Revelstoke and I you know, I relish that and I maybe took it a little too far at times. Um, so with that said, I, you know, was also a bit of a pyro. And when we would do our team parties, I was always messing around with, with gas and fire and, you know, it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt. And that's exactly what happened. I had, uh, almost two liters of gas spill on me in a, in a stunt gone horribly wrong. You know, I was basically making my own version of like a Molotov cocktail and just, just, you know, being a stupid teenager and uh, one thing led to another and, you know, I, I, I basically blew up and was lit on fire um, and was transported to Vancouver General. And that's where that's where for me, like the, the whole journey really started, because, again, like I said, I didn't have a ton of adversity, you know, some little things that every kid grows up with. Sure. But but at the, at the end of the day, that was I was really thrust into that. Uh, like I said, it's ex- very extreme adversity. And yeah, I woke up there. Uh, the next day, not, I didn't even know I was in Vancouver. Um, so, so that night was, it was pretty traumatic. You know, we were unfortunately in the middle of nowhere at a bush party, uh, no service. We couldn't call 911 and I was in pretty bad shape. And, uh, yeah, we finally got there and woke up in, in Vancouver. And like I said, the journey started. 
Yeah. And I mean, uh, what was the, the initial prognosis was from my understanding that your hockey career, or at least the way they thought of it, right? This is your adversity was, was over at that point, right? So how, mm -hmm. how do you kind of work through that process and, and actually, you know, get to a point where you make it to the NHL? Yeah, well, that, that's kind of why I wrote the book. It's a, it was a long journey. So it was, so I don't remember a ton in the first couple of days. It was, you know, pretty foggy. I just remember kind of coming in and out of my morphine, you know, not a coma, but my morphine induced sleep. Right. And, you know, just again, seeing my parents and, you know, it was very emotional we, because really we didn't know what the prognosis was for those first few days. Um, and that finally came day three. So I came out of my first debridement procedure, which is, uh, you know, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's basically torture where they, they have to yeah. essentially, they put you under skin, you alive basically and slough off mm -hmm. all that, that scar tissue builds up so fast and they're really buying time for the eventual skin graft surgery. Right. So mm -hmm. I come, I come out of that procedure and the doctor is going to come in our room, which he does and going to relay my prognosis because again, we didn't really know what, what the future was to hold. And the first thing he did was he looked at my parents because they're a mess still, right? They don't know, am I going to make it at this point? Um, and we knew it was bad, obviously, like I'm in Vancouver, there were only 10 beds at the time. So the 10 worst burns in the province. And so he looks at my parents and, and says, it's okay. Your, your son is not going to die. He's going to be okay. Um, and then he said, you know, he's lucky. He's a very lucky young man. Uh, it doesn't look like his face is going to be permanently scarred. And it doesn't look like we're going to have to skin graft over any of his joints, which is a very good thing. But mm -hmm. he's going to be in here for a long time. And it's, it's going to be a long road. He's 40% second, third degree burns. And basically, yeah, we're going to, you know, focus on rest and pain management. And, and we're going to hopefully get his skin graft surgery done here in the next couple weeks kind of thing. So I think while my parents took some solace in that fact, you know, in my naive young brain, all I'm thinking about in that moment was, <laughs> Hey, I have training camp in, in like three and a half months. Right. And I'm going into my last year of junior hockey eligibility. And so for me, I was always chasing the NCAA. That was, that was my NHL because I, I was good, but I wasn't that good. You know, I, I got cut from select teams as a kid and I snuck into to junior A as a fighter. And, you know, that was a little bit more part of the game back then. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is almost 20 years ago now. And, and I was pretty good at it, but, you know, not someone destined to go play pro hockey. So I was a, I was a long shot, you know, aside from, from this, this injury. And, you know, I made the mistake of, of putting governors on that dream at a pretty young age, right? Because I just, again, to me, it didn't seem like that wasn't really a possibility. And, you know, the protecting those limiting beliefs of what we're capable of, right? But mm -hmm. so so for me, that was always the the end. The the dream was the NCAA. And I had yet to even talk to one of these these scouts from the NCAA because they're not really recruiting fighters. You can't fight in the NCAA, right. as you know. Right. Yeah, um, definitely not with a face mask, right? You don't want to. <laughs> yeah, least. no. So uh, full but cage, I, I should say. Yeah, but I was like slowly adding layers to my game every year, and I figured, you know, I'm going into my last year, and I, I was confident I could get a scholarship somewhere. Maybe it was Div three. I didn't really care, and mm -hmm. so I, you know, I asked the doctor in the burn unit, "What does this look like? Like, I have training camp coming up, and yeah, I'll, I'll never forget the look." on his face because i'm sure no one's asked him that you know in that situation like i'm full mummy head to toe you got to remember like when you're on fire like i was a hundred percent burnt right mm -hmm. my it was you know the my face and you know the areas that weren't you know second third degree it was it was a really bad first degree burn so at the time they just they basically bandaged you you all up right and and that's i i saw his face and i was like oh it <laughs> it's over. <laughs> All right. And he, you know, he, he laid that gavel down and, and said, listen, these recoveries take years, not months. Uh, you're going to be in here for, for a long time. Um, I didn't know what that meant, but basically throughout the summer is what he was kind of saying. And 
And so in that moment, I, I, I kissed that dream goodbye and I thought, okay, well, I guess, you know, hockey's over. Um, so f- the first couple of weeks was really dealing with, uh, trying to balance these different emotions. I mean, number one, you're in a ton of pain, so you're really trying to manage that. But mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, down and depressed of, you know, what, what my life was supposed to look like, you know, talk about that loss of identity. So I'm not a hockey player anymore. Uh, I'm a burn survivor. Like what, what does that mean for me and who am I going to be now? Uh, uh-huh. But on the, on the flip side, I was very grateful, you know, that, that I was going to be okay. And I might look mm-hmm. a little different and have some gnarly scars, but I would live a, a relatively normal life. So right. that was really my first two weeks. And, you know, obviously something changed and that moment came about two weeks in and I got a call from my junior coach and uh, he said he was talking with one of the assistant coaches at Brown University and I know that's where our connection comes sure, in here yep. and and he he's telling me this he's I'm on the phone you know I got the my parents put the phone in between my ear and my shoulder because remember I can't move I'm totally bedridden right uh, and uh, he said that these that Brown's looking for a certain type of player and his uh, his exact words, what he's relaying to me is, they need a guy to put the fear of God in the defenseman of the Ivy League. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what I did. So right. he says, I got the perfect guy for you. There's just one major problem. He's laid up in the burn unit and it, it doesn't look good. So he right. says, they want to talk to you. Give them a call. I know you got the time. And so my parents take down the number and we, we call... Oh. Uh, Danny Brooks, who was the, one of the assistants at the time, and it was it was left really open ended. It really was just they said, "We're sorry to hear what happened. We wish you the best in recovery." And almost as a formality, they said, "You know, maybe we'll get to see you play one day down the road. Just you know, take care of yourself. We're thinking of you." And that was kind of sure. it. And we hung up the phone, and and that's I remember getting really emotional with my mom and dad there. Because again, I'd worked my whole life to just talk to one of these guys and I had finally done it. And, you know, look where I was, look what I had done to myself. And I naturally just started asking, I started asking why. So they're telling me I can't play hockey. Okay, why? And there was a really good long list of reasons, right? Right. Right. Infection was probably number one. Mm -hmm. Uh, The skin grafts were going to be very limiting, very painful. I had to wear a full body suit uh, for two years. I couldn't, you can't sweat from those grafted areas anymore, mm-hmm. right? Because the third degree burns, they, they burn through everything. So mm-hmm. if we're, we were, we didn't know, are we talking like 25% to 40% skin grafts? You know, there's issues with being able to cool down and sweating. So the list just went on and on. And, and basically, again, in my naive young head, I thought, you're, you're telling me it's going to hurt too much. That's what I'm hearing. And I thought, well, it can't be worse than what I've just been through these past couple right. of weeks. So, uh, yeah, I made I made a choice and a promise to myself that I don't accept, you know, this this gavel you've laid down for for what my life's supposed to look like. And yeah, honestly, like that decision was so powerful, and I I was truly like willing to die before giving up. I really mm-hmm. was, and and there was a lot of power in that. So that's where you know people ask me, how did you discover visualization and and this is how. So when I wow. reclaimed that dream and I grabbed it back, remember, I couldn't move. So my body was out of commission and I figured this was my only way out. And I hadn't, you know, I've heard, I had heard of visualization. I didn't, didn't read any fancy books or research anything that came later in my life, obviously. Um, but I just started visualizing everything I wanted, you know, reframing. Mm-hmm. I started reframing the pain. Uh, and visualizing at a cellular cellular level healing and those third degree burn areas just shrinking and healing and walking out of the hospital uh, that first game that fall being in the dressing room with my teammates and and the guiding star for this this visualization practice was that commitment letter to brown so i would just obsess over that and just have that vision and Hey, Aaron, for a moment, for, for our listeners who don't, don't under, uh, maybe aren't familiar with it, right? You call it cinematic mind mapping visualization, right? Yep. So can, can you share what that is and, and what the benefits are for those who can kind of master that technique or that skill, totally. I should say? Yeah, yeah. It's really at the core is thinking about your life as a movie 
and where you know you get to be the director of that and you get a say in that um and almost taking yourself into that reality so i you know think of your your brain there's a big screen tv that's you know something's being projected onto that at all times any thought mm-hmm. you have is projected back there uh and i tell people think of visualization as like you're giving yourself the remote now to change the channel on what's being projected back there um and the beauty with with this practice is there's no limitations right so it gets to be whatever you want there's no limitations in in the mind and that's really powerful um so in the burn unit i didn't re- realize what i was necessarily doing in the superpower that i was really unearthing and you know mm-hmm. in that practice um so i didn't necessarily think about it in that moment so this this technique really came to me when i was at brown uh so we're we're sort of fast forwarding but that's okay uh i guess i can say like that recovery was was absolute hell and the doctors were were right i shouldn't have been playing hockey i really shouldn't have um but i did and you know i i wanted to give up at some point every single day but that vision was too strong it it just was too strong for me to give up um so fast forward into brown I got to, you know, talk with my coach after my junior year and he he put the bug in my ear. Have you thought about pro hockey ever? And when I went to Brown, I again, that was my NHL, that was the end. So, right. I'm like my perspective on life had also changed when you go through something like that. So, I just went and had fun. Like I worked my ass off, but at the end of the day, I was taking pre-med and that was where I got to learn more about the brain and the body, which was really cool and had almost essentially learned a little bit of what I had been what I'd gone through with you know neuroplasticity and kind of rewiring those pathways for belief right and trust in that journey and when this was like my second maybe epiphany or whatever fork in the road at at Brown when after that coach had that conversation with me and I decided I'm going to play in the NHL like that's good, that's easier than what I had done here um, right. and that's really when I got the idea of thinking about this as as a movie, right? And and I tell people, you know, I, I can ask you that. What what makes a good movie in your mind? Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, there's got to be some happily ever after there. You know, something that you're striving for. There's got to be adversity along the way to make that happily ever after worthwhile, right? Yeah. So uh, you know, you there there are certain elements that probably are consistent throughout, and. Right. Uh, you know, I would even say, although you formally seem like you started implementing this at Brown, it really sounds like to me, maybe you just didn't know what it was. Right. You were probably exactly. utilizing this to some degree in that burn unit, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. when I made that decision at Brown, the first thing I thought of like, you know, okay, what did, what got me out of that burn unit? And it was this visualization practice. So to go back, I got out of that hospital in six weeks. Uh, which was a lot sooner than they were telling me. Sure, and, and ended up going to play that that home opener and, and committed to Brown a couple months later. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. I, I didn't exactly know in that moment when I was young. And again, right. I, I, that's when I really thought about you know this. Okay, what, if this was a movie, and it'd be a really great movie because of what I had gone through that adversity and, and comeback story. That was the theme I wanted for my movie. And it would, Hey, this would be the ultimate ending. And so again, that's really where the practice lies is just thinking about your life as a movie. And, and the, the more you can sit in that reality and, and really try and cultivate some emotion through that, then that's where the magic starts happening. And, and you start, you know, rewiring the pathways in your brain and, uh, you know, again, a little bit with manifestation, even right. Your if you, your brain doesn't actually know the difference between physically experiencing something and mentally rehearsing it, right? So, right. if you can have live in that reality in this visualization and sit in the emotion with that ending, your brain's going to think that's happened, right? Mm-hmm. And so, there's a lot of power in that where you you slowly just become that person, and it it so I guess twofold. It really cultivates that sense of trust and belief in yourself but the other piece of this is obviously it's not visualize your movie and sit on your ass all day and you know watch netflix and go on social media so for me the other part was it just drove the obsession and you know the choices and daily habits align because that vision was was so strong every choice i made i said 
is this aligning with that vision or is it not? Right. Yeah. And so that was now, a big I, piece of it. I, I think for a lot of, you know, student athletes, you know, especially going to a university like Brown Ivy league, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe not so much for those going to the Browns of the world, but I, I think student athletes in general, sometimes the student part gets lost. Right. And, mm. you know, during your time at Brown, you majored in human biology. Now, was that pretty much, did you go down that path as a result of your experiences in the burn unit? Was it like a desire of learning more about, you know, what your body w went through or was there some other motivation there for you? Yeah, a little bit of both. So I was always a science guy and a little bit to your point of my experience and just I, I wanted to learn more about that and, and the body. And like I said, that the experience I had was was very profound and, and powerful. So one of the best pieces of advice I got when I went there, because uh, we had a good mentorship program. So I had a mentor there and I I was just going to go and do what everyone else on the team was doing. Right. Because, again, I didn't think I was going to play hockey after Brown. So right. I figured I'd, you know, take business and work on Wall Street or get involved, like something in finance or something, right? And uh, my mentor, I owe a lot of credit to him. And he said, what do you want to take? And I'm like, well, I want to take science. I want to learn about the body and the mind. He's like, do that. He's like, some of the most successful people that I know have random degrees in you know, geology or history or mm -hmm. whatever it is, it, that's not the point. Um, he's like, take what you want to take. And that was, that was really good advice. So I ended up taking, you know, pre-med and it, it made my workload a lot heavier and it was, you know, a challenge to, to balance all that while being an athlete. But I'm really glad I did because again, I got, you know, to learn a sure. ton. Um, and, and yeah, again, if hockey wasn't an option, I, I was going to go to med school. That was, that was kind of my plan. So that's, that's where my mind went, but I just, I almost, you know, made the mistake of just following everyone and, and doing, you know, what was maybe the quote unquote right thing to do and the easiest path to maybe a career after, after school, really. Yeah. Well, it seemed like you went down a path that uh, was your path, which is uh, yeah. most important and one that you're, you're happy with. You know, I, I've had a few athletes, you know, on the show, uh, Dan Carcillo, uh, yeah. Johnny Lazarus, uh, Ryan VC, Cody Bass, Theo Fleury. And, you know, there's a common thread and, you know, in terms of, you know, shared similar tales about like facing a loss of identity and feeling a loss of purpose, which, you know, re really happened to you at that moment in that hospital. And then I'm yeah. sure again, you probably experienced it similarly, but in a different way at the end of your uh, life after hockey, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, they all say it's like, you know, the emotional side of it is tough. And, you know, I think to a person, they all say, you know, they miss being in the room with with the yeah. guys and the yeah. other players. Right. That's when, when they say at the end of the day, that's like their biggest kind yeah. of takeaway that, that that they miss. And I'm sure very similar for you as well. You know, what what advice do you have for other athletes who, you know, feel that similar level of loss? And it, it doesn't necessarily even have to be from a professional level to stop playing. It could even be like what your original goal was, collegiate level, stop playing, or even some people's careers end at junior hockey or high school hockey, wherever that is. You know, what yeah. advice do you have for other athletes to try to you know, work through that process uh, a little bit easier. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to just kick open doors. You know, you know, I made the mistake of, I mean, I was dealing with my neck injury that caused me to retire. And, you know, a lot of other things in life were hitting me hard. I, I was going through a divorce, my dad got sick. Uh, and then you tie on that loss of identity. Um, I think that was a mistake looking back that I didn't just start kicking open doors. Because again, that I think the biggest things were, yeah, being around the guys, that camaraderie you really miss, but the other was having just that sense of purpose, right? And you're sure. not, you're not going to get that sense of purpose by, by sitting around. And, you know, it, it, it really drug me down, you know, to the depths without that. Um, and then as soon as I started kicking open doors, granted, they weren't the right ones, you know, <laughs> and I think that's where, where we have, you know, a little bit in common. I worked in wealth management for, for, 
two year, two, just over two years. Um, and it ultimately, like I said, my, there was a lot of turmoil in my life at the time. So the timing mm-hmm. didn't line up, but, um, for me, like that wasn't the right door, but I, mm-hmm. I'm glad I did it. I met some amazing people. I enjoyed a lot of things about it. Um, and I, I just started kicking open other doors and eventually it led me to what I'm doing now and, and getting my book out there. So I, I, I see, I'm a, I seem to be allergic to the easy way, uh, <laughs> in life, but again, I think that's by design and I'm, I'm glad that it, you know, that it was my pathway and there's no one sure. right path. It's just your path. Um, yeah. but I think that would be the biggest thing is just, just kick open doors and they might not be the right one, but you know, you're, you're doing I'll something. figure it out. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about your book for a second. You know, why did you write uh, fi- Fighter Defying the NHL Odds? You know, what was the impetus there? You know, was it kicking down a door or was it, you know, kicking down the door and seeing that this was something you were really passionate about wanting to write about? Yeah. So I guess to, to piggyback off what I was saying with kicking these doors open. So I had left the wealth management. I remember my, my dad was, was sick and I was, I took a leave of absence because like I said, it, I just needed some time away. It was, it was a lot of rough things happening in my life and I was scheduled to come back. And I remember talking to my dad and I was just like, I don't think this is for me, you know, just again, more purpose. I was, again, mm-hmm. if there was adversity and, you know, there was hard things about it, I, that wasn't the issue. It was just that deep rooted purpose. And I remember him saying, well, do you see yourself doing this in five years? And I said, you know, absolutely not you know, I'm going to be probably looking, you know, for the next thing. And he said, then, then do that. Uh, so I ended up leaving that almost bought a business locally. Uh, I was that close and, you know, thankfully I didn't because COVID hit shortly after. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was kind of back to the drawing board, like what door am I going to kick open now? And I remember I had just moved to, to Lake country, which is in the Okanagan here. And, sat on this bench where I, you know, I would go meditate or do my visualization practice. And the book had always been a side project, you know, it was always in the background, all my buddies, you know, that were kind of behind the scenes on my team that year from the get go, they're like, you need to write a book. Cause this is, mm-hmm. this is crazy what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I shouldn't have been playing hockey. Uh, and so I thought maybe it's time t- to do that, but you know what, on the same token, I was scared to write that book. I didn't want to write that book because, you know, vulnerability and we weren't sure. really great with that as men in hockey. I think it's getting better. But, you know, again, I was scared to write it, but it all came down to if I could just even help one person, you know, just hold on to the dream for a little longer, uh, navigate that adversity, then then that would be a win. So at the end of the day, I said, well, now, now seems like a perfect time. It's COVID. You can't, can't do anything. And I started writing and I got about, yeah, I'd say halfway through the book. And then the light bulb went off where I'm like, this is what I need to do. This is my calling. Like te- teach people the power of visualization and with this technique, with the cinematic mind mapping. And it's, it's given me so much, uh, in life, not just, you know, professionally in, in my athletic career, but just, just in my personal life as well. Um, so. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, along those lines, I mean, I, I've heard you share how the journey on, you know, being a mindset coach really has given you insight, also uh, as part of your process, into how the pressure, you know, is being felt younger and younger for athletes. You yeah. know, um, you know, we were talking about it before we went on air. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, just about hockey. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's this pressure to, you know, be stronger, faster, smarter, younger and younger. You know, what what advice do you have for those that are listening that have or are a, you know, a young student athlete, you know, for the, the players and the parents? I think the biggest thing that I see now is that the, the kids are afraid to make a mistake and to fail. Um, you know, it's funny when I started this business years ago. I originally was working with, and I still do with primarily professional college athletes. And I've progressively gotten a lot younger because I didn't really have a grasp. My, my oldest is eight. So at the time, you know, I wasn't in that world of teenagers and I didn't really realize how big of an issue this is 
you know, mm -hmm. with per performance anxiety and, and these kids are just, they, they can't make a mistake where I remember myself at that age, I didn't have anxiety because we, it was a totally different world. Right. And so mm -hmm. now with the different pressures, whether it be, sometimes it's parental pressure, uh, you know, I think social media is a big one where, again, we live in this perfectionism world and we have this idealistic, you know, outlook on life where, you know, if I'm, if I got cut or you know, maybe I'm injured or whatever the adversity is, then, then I failed. And I think the, the biggest thing I've seen is kids now, they tie their, their, their self-worth to their performance. And that's a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. I, for, and maybe for yourself when they never, they were totally separate entities. And now because of all these pressures, the kids, again, like I said, tie their, their worth as a human being to how they perform, whether it's on the field, on the ice. And that's where, you know, we start seeing these big problems of like really nervous anxiety. Um, and if they make a mistake, not only is the game over, like the whole week is ruined and they just get, they spiral. Right. Um, so I think that's the are there things the that we can be doing either the the athletes themselves or the parents to help try to alleviate that at all? I think promoting failure uh, and I think having permission to make the mistake. I think a, a, another big thing too is how serious sports are at such a young age. I think that's a problem. I'm I'm dealing with you know I'm just getting into that world with with my son and he's he's eight mm -hmm. and just i see a lot of the the parents you know just there's so much pressure for these kids and it's it's a full-time job i mean hockey is I, i'm sure other sports as well but for me it's just just be a kid like mm -hmm. you know and and just have fun and don't like the whole mistakes i don't know i think that's a big problem with because it there's a, this pressure. So then the mistake gets amplified at a young age mm -hmm. where they, they should just be kids. Um, if yeah. you're, if you're, you know, 13, 14, 15, then it's, then it's time to, you know, to start going and, and some pressure comes with that territory. But I think just having the tools, visualization is a great tool because you can take yourself into that reality where you don't have, you know, any of that that anxiety, right? And that'll start to spill over into your life um, and, and performance. So might also give you a way to, I would imagine, to uh, prepare yourself for it and learn totally. how to accept it and not ruin, ruin your week, right? Maybe, yeah. you know, use it as a tool to kind of look back and see what you might have done differently to make it a positive outcome so that that pressure yeah. is alleviated to some degree, too. Yeah. And the preparation through the, I call it rehearsal imagery with the visualization and just executing the skills, whether it's, you know, on the ice or, you know, if, if you're a non-athlete, what are the skills that you need in your life and maybe your business and just rehearse that and visualize it mm -hmm. every day. And like you said, it, it totally, you know, affects your confidence and increases that. But again, it's not to say that you're not going to make a mistake, Right. It's right. just that overall right. trust. So when the mistake comes and there's techniques that, you know, I talk about in order to deal with that, but you just have this overall trust again um, through that preparation. Right. Yeah. So uh, let me, I, I feel like I have to ask as somebody who played in the NHL kind of had this dream of making it NCAA and that was like your goal, you know, and the story is a, a really great lesson on how to, you know, attack, overcome adversity. You know, in hockey in particular, you know, how can we continue to help the hockey culture evolve? You know, I think it's one of the greatest sports out there. And I think that there are some cultural flaws out there with regard to the sport. Some of it we've talked about already, others we haven't. But are, are there things that we could be doing to help the hockey culture evolve in a, in a positive way? That's a really good question. I think it's a tough question. Um, for me, I think it's just about being able to talk about it and provide a, a safe place for people to talk about it because yeah, I think it has, it's come a long way. Um, but it really like, I mean, inclusivity, inclusivity is, is a big one, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think the other thing is just, again, destigmatizing maybe what it means to be a man in, in especially, I mean, really a man in general in the world, but you know, especially in the hockey culture, because I dealt with this and it was a shift after hockey of, you know, we weren't 
really taught to be weak, quote unquote, weak and, mm -hmm. and show vulnerability. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing is just providing a safe place. Again, it's getting better, but really just talking about it and being able to share your struggles, right? Because we, we, we didn't really have that because we didn't want to be perceived as weak. And I didn't, Hey, he's like, I didn't want to get sent down. If I go talk to someone, am I going to get sent down? So mm -hmm. I think that's starting to change, but just again, and there's, there's avenues people can go now. Um, but I still think it, it, it exists to some degree. And I'm sure some mm -hmm. of your past guests would probably, agree. probably yeah. agree on that. Um, sure. and not necessarily like demasculinizing people like, you know, you, you can still be a man and carry those traits, but you can also <laughs> How, you're a human being. You can. You're. You're supposed to. You know, to some degree, have some of these feelings, and and you need to unpack that and talk about it. So, I think I agree. Yeah. just talking about and provide. You know, providing athletes access to to these places to to talk about their struggles and and have it be a sign of strength, not weakness, right? And that's where yeah. again, I think it is slowly changing, but. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I tend to agree with you. I think it is changing. I think the tide's turning. We have some ways to go, but uh, at least we're heading in the right direction, which is great. Yeah. And Aaron, it's been great sharing your story. We end each of our shows asking our each of our guests the same question, because we are all about joy here on the Midland Money Mindset. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we just moved. So I went to the dump today. That felt pretty good. But. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I think for me that I have non-negotiables, you know, in my life, which are my visualization practice and exercise. So for me, I know if I don't do those mentally, I, I, I'm not, I, I feel off. Um, mm -hmm. So I think those are the big things and just gratitude. You know, I, I wake up give my wife a little sleep in and I, I wake up with the kids and we, I really cherish those moments. So I sure. think those are the three biggest cool. things. Yeah. Enjoy it. Think it goes like that. Mine I know. 17 and 20. It went flew by very quick, I know. very quick. quick. Right. Yeah. But yeah. So listen, we're going to have all of your information in the show notes. We'll have, you know, links to your book, et cetera. But if people want to learn more about you, learn more about visualization, more, more about uh, what you are doing today and connect with you. What's the easiest and the best way for them to do that? Yeah, probably my website. It's just my name, AaronVolpatti.com. There's, there's tons of info on there and different programs available. And then my social media, uh, just at Aaron Volpatti. So I would say one of those two avenues is, is the best place. Great. Well, check him out. Check out his visualization techniques. I think it's a fabulous work. And I think that, uh, as you alluded to, or maybe even said, you know, it's not just for athletes, it's for business people, entrepreneurs. We could all use these techniques to uh, help us become ve better versions of ourselves. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Aaron. I'm glad you are have been able to overcome all of this adversity and it's uh, turned you into the person that we know you today and i appreciate you and uh enjoy the day yeah thanks larry thanks for having me it was a blast thank you